Johnny Red Cole is captain. Boss man, do you ever pray? Well, if I miss this deal, let this hammer get away. Mara be your barren day, Lord, Lord. Let Mara be your barren day. This is on mass, bringing together stories of struggle and hope from the working class. I'm your host, Liz Medina. You better listen, my brother, because if you do, you can hear their voices still calling from across the years. Dear friends, welcome to the Labor Radio Podcast Network profile series highlighting the work of our members. The growing network of over 70 shows in four countries serves as a one-stop shop for audiences looking for labor content and as a resource for labor broadcasters, podcasters, and content producers. My name is Evan Papp, and I produce Empathy Media Lab's podcast on labor, political economy, arts, and culture, and we're a proud member of the Labor Radio Podcast Network. Liz Medina from In Mass. Very glad to uh, be speaking with you. Could you talk a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, and what led you to organized labor? Sure, absolutely. So I grew up in Baldwinsville, New York, which is in central New York. If you Google where the Rust Belt is in New York, that community is certainly part of it. And I think being in that kind of environment of deindustrialization, seeing a lot of shops being closed repeatedly around me, and a lot of working class family struggle gave me a critical mindset from the beginning. And of course, I am part of the millennial generation and I graduated from college thinking that was my ticket to this middle class in 2008 in the middle of the financial crisis. And shortly thereafter, Occupy was a response to that ongoing recession. And it was a very politicizing moment for me. And I really got this strong sense of class consciousness, as many others did for the first time, as a result of the events. The idea that there is an elite 1% and the 99% who have shared interest and shared material conditions. And so I decided to study political economy and become more involved in uh, the labor movement and advocating for working families. And I always considered my self a working class person and I'm the first person in my family to go to college. So um, that's pretty much part of my milieu as well. Um, so I, I would say that's the short answer of how I became involved is just experiencing these um, really eye-opening uh, historical and economic events. So you, you mentioned you were, you're surrounded by what was formerly an industrial area and now the, one of the, the Rust Belt along uh, the Great Lakes. I'm from, born in Cleveland, grew up in Michigan, lived a bit in Chicago. And uh, can you talk about what was the industry uh, before it got hollowed out? Yeah, we had a mix of industries in central New York. Uh, we had steel, we had um, machine manufacturers, um, and we had the canals as well, um, and transportation. So uh, the steel obviously is highly automated and very much closed. Um, I think Crucible Steel still operates in around Syracuse, but there's probably only a dozen or so people that work there. Um, we do have some military industrial activity that is keeping the area somewhat alive. We have Lockheed Martin in um, Syracuse area, uh, which is probably one of the larger employers um, that pays its workers decently. But of course, unfortunately, um, they are creating you know, weapons of mass destruction and creating war um, and things that are not um, helpful to our society. Um, we also had um, a lot of chemical uh, corporations who have left their mark. Um, Lake Onondaga is, I think, one of the most polluted um, freshwater bodies in the United States, if not even further. Um, and that's the result of uh, you know, years and years of industrial pollution and dumping right into that lake. Um, so 
um, industry has left a devastating impact on that community. If you just drive around through Syracuse, you can actually smell the lake. Um, they're working on capping it right now, but yeah, it's, it's scarred the land and there's not a lot of opportunity left. I think one of the probably biggest employers are um, service sector now, uh, like in most places, we have um, a failing mall, Destiny USA, that promised to bring a lot of jobs to that area. Obviously, those jobs are not very sustainable and they're very low paid. Um, so that's, that's the environment that I was immersed in growing up. So for those who may not be interested or aware of labor news, why do you think unions and organized labor are important and should be covered? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I think these days a lot of people aren't familiar with labor unions at all because so little of our workforce, particularly in the private sector, are unionized. And so we, most working people don't have an experience of what organized labor can do. And of course, um, whenever organized labor has uh, become corrupt or done something wrong, that's what is publicized and spread throughout our media environment. Um, versus all the things that we've gained over the years from organized labor. And I think um, just studying more of the history myself personally has really shown me why unions and organized labor are so important. I don't think it's a mistake that most of us don't learn that a lot of the comforts and privileges that we enjoy today are the result of organized labor, of working people coming together and demanding better lives for themselves, things such as the eight hour of the day, the weekend, a lot of the workplace safety protections. And um, as a socialist um, interested in creating a society that puts people over profits, I think labor and working people are have the power to actually make that change because we are the ones who create the world around us. We are the ones producing the goods and services. So we have immense power. We do the work and we can make the world differently if we coordinate and organize ourselves to do so. Absolutely. And if we're helping to uh, grow the food and, and we should be able to bear, we should be able to enjoy the fruits of the labor as well and not let it all go to someone else. Absolutely. Could you talk about your show in mass and why you wanted to start it and what it's about? Absolutely. So the show in mass came about as a way to showcase an oral history project I had done in my own community um, in central Vermont, where I live now. And I was looking for a way to share some of the amazing life histories and work histories of the people I interviewed. And the whole reason I got into oral history, particularly oral history of working people's lives, was to expand um, our understanding of the everyday struggles people are facing and the aspirations of everyday people as well. My background is, is in actually fine arts, uh, visual arts, painting and drawing. So I'd always been interested in having deep conversations with people in a way but I was finding myself to be very frustrated with the insularity and frankly elitism of the art world that I was seeing. Now, you know, of course there's many exceptions, but that's, that was my feeling. And so I decided to totally reinvent my practice. And I was really inspired by um, one of my friends who's a journalist and he told me about the work of Studs Terkel and working. And after having read those oral histories, I was just so excited because our lives are so multidimensional and touch upon so many issues and connect us to one another and create a sense of common, um, common struggle, even if we have a lot of unique differences about ourselves as well. So En Masse is a way of bringing these oral histories together, of talking about issues broadly outside of the context of um, a specific campaign or anything else and um, creating some kind of unity, um, creating some kind of class consciousness and um, shared uh, experiences around class. Because I think our society um, really atomizes people um, as a way to disempower us and trying to bring together 
um, our stories in a way on mass to show that um, a lot of our personal struggles are indeed shared and part of a, a, a larger structure in our society of um, a capitalist political economy of, of a certain way of doing things um, can show that you know we have a shared interest in making things different and we can bring ourselves together to do that. And that's, I know, very ambitious and very broad. Um, that is what I'm trying to do with the show. And that's why I'm having people perform others' stories as part of season one of En Masse to give narrators um, an opportunity to relate to other people's stories. And I like that in your show note description. It's also about struggle and hope. And, and the idea that there have been so many setbacks, but there's also been victories and hope is a very important part of the struggle that, that things can be better and, and, and being able to bridge the struggle with other, if you feel you're suffering, other people have suffered before and that is a bridge that connects us all. Absolutely. And I think talk, uh, that hope in everyday lives is so inspirational for me personally uh, because not most of us don't feel like you know we are all powerful you know we are going to be the next leader of some movement the next mother jones or anything like that um you know we just you know it gives inspiration and hope to regular people such as myself looking at these stories and how they have faced immense challenges been aware of what the reality is and having that knowledge and knowing what the problems are and oftentimes coming together to resolve that. In the case of uh, the buried granite workers, which were explored in season one, uh, a lot of them in the early 20th century were dying in the 30s and 40s because of the dangers of the granite manufacturing process, the silica dust that was produced and cutting up their lungs. And they knew that they had to come together to solve this problem. Otherwise, their communities would be devastated for years to come. Families would be broken and they would continue to lose um, their fathers and their brothers and their, you know, the people they loved. And so they came together. They staged multiple strikes. They unionized. And eventually, by the 40s, they did get the ventilation systems and the safety equipment they needed that drastically improved their lives and meant that work was no longer this life sacrifice per se and that you know they could be with their loved ones in community you know as long as they should be and yeah it, it's it's huge and that victory also was helping future people who had to work in such conditions and so that that victory there is that linear uh connection between generations and yeah very very beautiful and your your program your in mass is very high uh production quality and could you talk just how you learned about this and how you got into it because there's a lot of people who are interested in in doing podcasts and uh I think you you have one of those that people should hear because it, there's just a lot going on with the soundscapes and a lot of beautiful spacing and things like that. So, thank you, thank you so much for saying that. It it was a lot of work, and um, yet at the same time, what's so wonderful about podcasting and oral history, for that matter, um, is that both of these methodologies and mediums are very accessible, and it just takes patience and time to really learn how to do it. So I used an open source program. I don't have a lot of means. Um, and uh, I used Audacity, probably like most podcasters. It's pretty intuitive and simple to use. And you know, like most people <laughs> of my generation and, and younger, I've learned things from YouTubing my uh, problems and finding the answers from other people. And I also had the privilege of working in partnership with a local community radio station, WGDR, which is part of Goddard College, uh, for whom I work as a staff person, um, as a student life coordinator. And uh, there are, are people who work for WGDR who sometimes um, give classes on how to use Audacity 
during our residencies, um, during our um, you know degree program residencies, we have a low residency model at Goddard. But anyway, that's another story. Um, so I was able to you know take a, a class about how Audacity worked and also Google a lot of that and really find the way how to make this work. And so I also had access to the amazing mics and uh, production studio set up in WGDR to make season one. So I didn't have to buy all that fancy equipment. And now I'm kind of off on my own because of the pandemic has meant that that station is not open to pretty much anybody. They're just, you know, just the few personnel are allowed in that community radio station. So I'm having to adapt um, my practice again to try to produce something of high quality with even um, less means um, using my smartphone and trying my best to make up for the um, reduced audio quality and audacity, which isn't um, that challenging to do. It, it is possible. And I also, um, there's just amazing resources online to give, um, add sound effects and music that are uh, under Creative Commons licenses. Of course, you have to pay attention to what each license means and what that, how you can use it as a result. Um, but I was able to go to the Free Music Archive and find a lot of amazing uh, musical pieces that I was able to use um, under Creative Commons attribution licenses. And I went to, um, I found this wonderful site called freesound.org. Uh, which is a, a whole community of people who like to do field recordings and, you know, collect sounds and sometimes share those under Creative Commons licenses, which is just a wonderful resource. And I myself did field recordings too. Um, I was privileged to be invited to one of the uh, our granite manufacturers in Barrie uh, Global Values and go inside this manufacturing place and get some actual real sounds from the manufacturing process. So. Um, it's a lot of time and effort to weave all that together and, and learn everything and source everything and feel which pieces of music work and which sounds work and how to create dramatic pauses. Um, and I'm sure it's not a perfect formula that I've come upon, but um, if you, you know, have the patience and time, you can really, anyone can pull something uh, really of high quality together. Beautiful. And you don't necessarily need a big background in sound engineering and you don't need a whole lot of resources. But if if you're passionate and you are are willing to put the time in, uh, you can produce something beautiful like like in mass. So. As a member of the Labor, Labor Radio Podcast Network, could you talk about why you think this network is important and also just how you came about it, how you heard about it? Uh, because it's continually growing and uh, there may be other people who will hear this and want to join. Absolutely. I'm so excited this network exists and wow, what a serendipitous moment when I stumbled upon it. So I had finished producing all season one already and I was looking for my group of people to who would be excited about this and and um, are doing similar work so i felt less alone in what i was doing and i had already been listening to some podcasts that are part of this network or that joined this network very early on uh, such as working class history and um, the working life podcast with jonathan tassini and i just became interested in the whole idea of podcast networks. So I was doing some research about what podcast networks were out there. And I saw, and I looked at each show that I regularly listened to and, and look for what network they may belong to, if any. And I saw that these two shows were members of the labor radio network. And I said, huh, that sounds like the exact kind of network that would be suitable for me. I looked at other networks, um, and a lot of them seemed kind of exclusive and uh, yeah, like were, they didn't necessarily, it was more about storytelling for the sake of storytelling versus uh, a, a shared passion and, and, and interest in working people's lives. Um, so I looked at see these other networks and I'm like, yeah, uh, I don't think I'd first of all get in because they have really high barriers to entry and it is a more of an advertising marketing machine type of network 
and also I don't think they really care about labor and working issues. Not many media networks, frankly, do, unfortunately. Um, and that's why the labor radio network is so revolutionary and important. And so I, I, I saw the labor radio network on these two shows. I Googled the labor radio network. I saw there is a little button on the website for the labor radio network that, that said, add your show here. I was like, wow, they, they seem to have a really open door to people who are interested in this. And I sent um, the network an email and said, hey, I have this podcast that's focused on working people's lives. And you know, I, I'm a labor activist myself. I care about uh, working people and these issues. I would love to join your network. And pretty quickly, I think this was like in May, I received uh, a welcome with open arms from uh, Chris and um, Harold, um, who have really started this network and put so much effort into it and have done incredible work. Um, and I've, yeah, been so enamored with this community ever since, and I'm so excited to see how this network grows. Yeah, and that's that's how I uh, came across your work as well. Uh, I <clears throat> I joined in in June, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm just always inspired and humbled by uh, the amazing people and the amazing content being produced. So, so in closing, uh, looking into the future of organized labor, where do you see opportunity and hope? That is a really good question. Um, I can't claim to necessarily have the answer. But I think um, as a labor organizer, seeing the terrain and how much the standard organizing process going through the National Labor Board, having elections through the National Labor Board has really been corrupted in a way that makes it very difficult for working people to organize, even if the majority of workers in the workplace want to. And so I actually see the future of organized labor working around these decaying compromise systems of uh, the National Labor Board and, and, and these rules and regulations. I see a lot of hope in um, so, uh, labor organizations that take creative new approaches. I think in my own community in Vermont, I'm really inspired by migrant justice and how they've been able to win worker protections by organizing their workers and putting pressure on the supply chain. So they don't even necessarily have a single direct employer to whom they can uh, you know, air their grievances and ask for redress, but um, they do have certain people such as Ben and Jerry's and Hannaford's that carry a lot of the dairy products that they produce. And so they've been able to organize through rallies, protests and other demonstrations and allyship with other organizations committee to um, win contracts for their dairy workers who do not have any of the really protections of um, the National Labor Relations Act and, and other um, labor laws because a lot of them are undocumented and they're working in um, agriculture, which is oftentimes um, has a loophole for organization as well. And um, I don't claim to be an expert on labor law or anything like that, but I, I see how this organization in particular has successfully organized and improved the lives of its workers, despite the many limitations um, put up, uh, that, that they face um, because of who they are and the state of labor law in our country. Um, and so I, I think also in terms of, uh, re, you know, um, other workers as well, um, you know, trying to really petition um, employers to recognize their union before even going to um, through the Na uh, National Labor Relations Board because that um, going through this whole drawn up process that the National Labor Relations Board has set up creates too much of an opportunity for managers to propagandize and um, try to instill fear on their workers and disenfranchise them from coming together. Um, there's, as you know, so many um, anti-labor consultants out there that have unfortunately been very successful in workplaces. So I think, you know, really putting, coming together in a more direct action um, 
approach to organized workplaces is probably going to be successful. And I think, frankly, as labor law continues to fail American workers, we're going to have to, um, you know, go back to the old ways of, of organizing and getting our needs met. And sometimes that means strikes and um, general strikes sometimes is necessary. This is the environment that unfortunately we're in. We're in the unprecedented times where uh, employers and the business class and the ruling class are not afraid to take um, really egregious illegal actions to protect their narrow interests against the interests of everybody else. So we have to be prepared to respond in um, really powerful ways. You better listen, my brother, because if you do, you can hear their voices still calling from across the years. And they're crying across the ocean, they're crying across the land, and they will until we all come to understand. None of us are free, none of us are free. Can't see the light if we don't.